Hi, and welcome to today's video. I'm Amy from the Macaron Academy, and today we're going to be making a beginner macaron recipe. Start to finish, we're not leaving anything out, and this will be in real time. So this will be a longer video than what I normally um, publish. But I, I thought it would be very beneficial, especially for those of you that are new to making macarons, to truly see what all goes into making macarons, just so you're not caught by surprise and it helps you understand the techniques that make macarons and um, just what to expect. So with that, let's talk about the equipment that you need. So first of all, you need mixing bowls. We're going to put our ingredients in here. I'm gonna use two mixing bowls today and I'll show you that in just a moment when we measure our ingredients. But you need a mixer, whether it's a stand mixer or a hand mixer, um, that's fine. This will help you make the meringue. You need a spatula. We're gonna use that um, for the macronage stage. And one of the most important things you need is a kitchen scale. To be successful and have consistent results with macarons, it's imperative that you measure your ingredients. And when you measure by weight, you're always getting the exact ratios that you need for these recipes to work. So make sure, no matter what, you have a kitchen scale. Another item that is very beneficial is an oven thermometer. Residential ovens um, fluctuate. They're not meant to stay at a steady temperature the entire time. So to know what the true temperature is in the oven, you need an oven thermometer. And you don't be surprised if when you set your oven to a certain temperature, let's just say 300, and you find out the temperature is like 310 or 290, that is very common in residential ovens. That's why having an oven thermometer will help you in your macaron journey. And also what you need is after we make our batter, you need a piping bag. I use a cup to put the piping bag in. It just kind of acts as a third hand and makes things a lot easier. <clears throat> but the piping bag, um, they range in different sizes from 12 inches all the way up to 20. Um, this is a 20 inch reusable bag. You know, this is not a requirement, but I do make a lot of macarons, so um, it's just more environmentally friendly. Um, I'm also using a number 12 round tip to pipe my shells. That's gonna give me that nice round um, looking shell. And then you need a baking tray. Um, I will be baking on a Silpat mat. Um, a sil it's basically a silicone mat. Um, when you see the little circles here, those are a template that I made. Um, my sill pats are many years old before macarons really became popular in the United States. So I created this paper template that uh, circles are one and a half inches. I just placed that under my sill pat mat and that's going to help be a template for me so I can pipe consistently shaped and consistent size shelves. So. You need that, you need a baking tray. If you don't have a seal pack mat, don't worry. Uh, you can use parchment paper. Uh, parchment paper works fine. There's pros and cons to both, uh, but just use what you have today. Find out if you even like making macarons, first of all. And if you do, then you can invest in the stand mixer, the seal pack mats, and the other nice to have things, but just start with what you have. And with that, let's measure our ingredients. Let's start with our ingredients. The first thing we're going to do is fill a small pot with a little bit of water. My water comes to about one third to one half. We're gonna use this to make our Swiss meringue. What you wanna do is put it on the stove and let it get to just barely simmering. You don't want this to be a hard boil at all. Um, what we're going to do is measure egg whites and add egg whites and sugar um, in a bowl and set it on top of this of the simmering water. So you just barely want it bubbling. Okay, so let's put that on the stove. Now, let's measure our egg whites. For today's recipe, we need 120 grams of egg whites. That's going to be approximately four eggs, four large eggs. I've never separated eggs before. I'm gonna show you a really simple way to get the egg whites out. So I'm just gonna crack the egg and then I'm gonna use the shell to help separate. And I'm just gonna pour the yolk in one side and get the egg whites from the egg. 
Okay, that gave me 30 grams of egg whites. And just keep repeating until we get 120 grams. And you want to be very careful not to get any of the yolk in your egg whites. If you do get a yolk, you're gonna to have to start over. The yolk will kill your meringue. Your meringue actually won't even form. So it's, it's very imperative that you are careful with this and keep a very close eye on the yolk to make sure it doesn't split apart. And that one actually just cracked. So I'm gonna get rid of it before the yolk gets into the egg whites. Okay, I just wanna wipe my fingers real quick to make sure none of that yolk got there and into our egg whites. All right, last one. While we're measuring out the rest of our ingredients, our water can be warming up and simmering. Remember, we want it to be just a very gentle simmer. Okay, there we go. And now we have our egg whites. I'm gonna set these aside over by the stove. Now let's zero out our scale and measure 120 grams of granulated sugar. And then 120 grams is what we're looking for. Okay, 120 grams. If you get too much, just get a spoon, pour it back into the sugar. One thing I like to add to my sugar is dried egg white powder. This is not the same thing as meringue powder. All this is is dried egg whites. I like this because it seems to help stabilize the meringue and make it stronger. And it also seems to make my shells um, a little more light and fluffy, if that makes sense. Um, this is not a requirement, but it's just something I learned along the way um, several years ago, and I've been using it and it works, so I've just stuck with it. But don't fret if you don't have this. Um, the only place I've been able to find it is Amazon. So I have a link in the description below if you wanna check this ingredient out. But again, it is optional. I'm going to add five grams of dried egg whites to my granulated sugar. Okay, and then what, I'm, what I like to do personally, again, this is optional. Let me just turn the scale off. I just like to incorporate it into the sugar and kind of get rid of any of the lumps that the, egg, the dried egg white powder may cause. Does it make a difference in the, at the end um, with your shell? Honestly, I don't think so, but this is more of a habit than anything else. Okay, so that's well incorporated. I'm gonna put this over by our egg whites and continue measuring our dry ingredients. One more piece of equipment that you're going to need is a sieve or a sifter. Uh, we want to put our dry ingredients through the sifter um, before it gets incorporated into our meringue. So I like to kind of combine a couple of steps into one and save a little time. So I'm gonna put my sieve inside the bowl. I'm going to turn on my scale and we need 126 grams of almond flour. I'm just gonna pour it right into the sieve. I'm gonna leave this here, zero out the scale again, and now I'm going to add 126 grams of powdered sugar right on top of the almond flour. Now what I like to do um, it's your shells are going to turn out so much better if your powdered sugar and your almond flour is very well mixed together. Um, some people will use a food processor to mix the two together and then run it through the sieve. That's perfectly fine. I've done it that way. Um, I've also do it this way. Um, it just it's one less piece of equipment I have to wash, honestly. Um, but I'm going to combine the powdered sugar and the almond flour with a whisk and it's going to go through the seed at the same time while I'm doing this. So I'm achieving basically the same effect as the food processor. Um, you know, I will say the food processor will absolutely mix it better. Um, this is going to help give you smooth shells. Um, if you do not incorporate the two together, you, you're going to 
most likely end up with some lumpy or bumpy shells. And that's another reason why you need the sieve as well. That helps get rid of the, the bigger chunks, especially in the almond flour. Almond flour, even though you buy super fine, there's still some bigger pieces that won't go through the sieve, but that's okay. You'll see what I'm talking about in just a second. We're just gonna discard those pieces. Keep pushing. And another reason why I do it this way too, the biggest reason is just so I don't have to clean my food processor. But um, I have still got nice, beautiful shells um, with the smooth top. You might see, they might look a hair grainy compared to um, macarons that have gone through the food processor. But honestly, all the people that eat my macarons love them they don't complain and they talk about how pretty they are so that's all the justification i need okay and so i'm using the whisk like where where the uh, ingredients kind of clump up this will help break up some of those bigger clumps and i can get it through the sieve let me get it back down into the middle okay can you see this right here those are the larger chunks that we're going to discard if we keep those in with our dry ingredients, you will get lumpy or bumpy shells. So let's discard this. And I'm just gonna run the whisk through the bowl because um, the powdered sugar is so fine that it will get through the sieve faster than the almond flour. So I just wanna make sure now that everything's in the bowl, just kind of help incorporate a little more. We're gonna set this to, to the side and start our meringue. Now we're going to place our egg whites over the barely simmering water. I'm going to pour my sugar in with the egg whites. Now I'm going to whisk and mix it together. And what we want to do here is keep stirring until the sugar has completely melted. This will take about, I don't know, two minutes maybe. And how we will check if the sugar is melted, here in just a moment, I'll lift up the egg whites and I'll fill to see if any, if I can fill any sugar grains. If I fill grains, I'm gonna keep going. When, when this egg mixture um, no longer feels grainy, then I'm gonna transfer over to the stand mixer. This method is called the Swiss meringue method. And I'm teaching it this method because it, the meringue is more stable than the traditional French method. And it's not as technical as the Italian method. So in my opinion, it's beginner friendly. It has, it gives you a little more leeway um, in having successful shells at the, at the end of this. So my goal is for you to be a happy macaron maker and the people that I have taught the Swiss method to have really seemed to love it and agree that it's by far their favorite method of making macarons. And these were beginner macaron makers as well. Okay, let's check. The grains are almost gone. I can still feel a few, so I'm gonna stir for a little longer. I still feel just very, very tiny grains, almost there. I have a paper towel. Um, you probably can't see it on the film, but it's just right beside my stove here. After I fill the egg whites, your fingers are going to be sticky because of the sugar. I just wipe my finger on this paper towel that's right here beside the stove. Okay. I don't feel any more sugar, so I'm gonna turn off the stove. Take that off the heat, and we're gonna transfer to the mixer. Now 
we just pour the egg whites into our mixer. I'm just gonna turn it to a low speed for about 30 seconds. I'm going to add just a couple of drops of gold food coloring. Okay, now I'm going to go slowly go back up to a seven. check the stiffness of our meringue. We want stiff peaks where the peaks are very pointy and stick straight out. Okay, that's a pointy straight going straight out. And down here in the bowl is also a point. It's got a slight curve to it. I'm actually going to go just just because that has a little bit of a curve to it. See, this one isn't, I've put more meringue out there. The tip, we're very, very close, but I want it to be a little stiffer. So I'm going to keep beating the meringue just a tiny bit longer.
check again. Okay, yeah, I think we see how this point right here is straight out. We've got straight points here and here. See how stiff, see how stiff this is. Another test you can do, and the sun is coming out. <laughs> Another test you can do, does your meringue fall out of the bowl? Your meringue is done. Now that we've made our meringue, now it's time to incorporate the dry ingredients with the meringue, and we're going to do what's called the macronage stage. So when you make the meringue, you're feeling your egg whites full of air, right? Macronage actually means deflate. So we want to deflate some of this air as we macronage. Let me get it. Kind of get this meringue back in the bowl. Now we're going to take our dry ingredients. You can do this two different ways. And I would experiment with both. Um, find out just what's more comfortable for you because the more comfortable you are doing this, the better your results are going to be. I have tried this both ways and I've gotten the same results each time. So you can put your dry ingredients into your meringue and mix everything here in the bowl, or you can take your meringue and put it on top of your dry ingredients and then do everything here in the mixing bowl. Sometimes the mixing bowl has a wider mouth. It helps, it definitely helps with the macronage stage. Um, I know a lot of people love it this way and other people seem to have better results if they put the dry ingredients in the meringue. So again, there's no one right way to do this. Try both and see what feels best for you. Okay? so. For today's video, I'm going to put the dry ingredients into the meringue. And I'm going to start with about half of the dry ingredients. I'm going to start with half, and all I'm going to do is just incorporate the ingredients in with the meringue. We're just we're not really deflating at this point. We're just kind of folding, trying to incorporate the meringue and the dry ingredients together. Get these incorporated and then we'll add the rest. If you're using the mixer bowl because these bowls are deeper, make sure to really get up under the meringue and get the ingredients, the dry ingredients that settle down into the bottom of the bowl. Okay, I don't see any more, so I'm going to add the rest of our dry ingredients. I'll cut through the batter to try to help get those ingredients that are in there. We just want, we want it well mixed together where it looks like thick lava. So it looks like the batter is now incorporated. It looks like really thick lava. Now we're gonna start the macronage stage. So what I'm going to do is push the batter up against kind of the side of the bowl. I'm going to make what I call J motions, although it's a backwards J. But if you're right-handed, left-handed, do a motion with your hand that feels natural, okay? Some people don't even do the twist. That's fine. Um, I, I don't know, somewhere along the way I picked up J motions and push up against the side. If I use the mixer bowl, 
Another thing that I will do, and honestly for me it's much easier, I'll turn the bowl on its side. What I will do is um, I'll fold in the bowl and then I'll press out this way in the bowl and kind of use the side of the bowl, honestly, kind of as an extra hand. Um, I can hold it steady with one hand and then, you know, press with the spatula with the other. And then I'll fold again. So this is like folding, deflating, folding, deflating. Now, if you're doing the other way and doing J motions, let me pull my sleeves up here. Um, I will turn the bowl kind of a quarter turn as I do this along the side of the bowl. Now, what we're trying to get to is a ribbon-like stage. You want the batter to flow off your spatula like a ribbon. You don't want it to be too runny. Um, I'll show you when we get closer, kind of the things to look for. It's easier to show you than explain. Let's see. Let me just get everything back into the center here. <clears throat> okay, I'm lifting up. Okay, the batter is starting to ribbon off of the spatula, but see it kind of breaks off. It's still thick. So we're going to keep going. We want a more continuous flow than that. But you don't want to deflate all the air because the air is what makes those really pretty feet on macaron shells. So we still need a little air, but we're getting rid of, getting rid of some air and we're keeping some of the air. Okay, it's starting to flow off more, but it's still, it's still breaking apart, as you can see. And one of the things that we also want to watch for as, as our batter starts to thin out and get more ribbon-like, <clears throat> you want to look at how, how it lays back down into the bowl. So right here, you can see, you can still see the shape of where it ribboned off of the spatula. Um, it's not really kind of melting back into itself. So for the macronage stage, this is still too thick. We want to keep going. Somebody might have the question, is there a certain number of strokes you need to do to get the batter at the right consistency? I'm going to be honest with you. I've tried to count, and it's honestly very hard. Um, I go more on sight and how it ribbons off the spatula. And that's just, it's kind of the art of making macarons. You've, I highly, highly, highly recommend you document everything, especially early on in your macaron journey. Write down the consistency of the batter. How did it, like in your own words, how did it flow off of the spatula? What did it look like? What, how thick was it? Okay, now we're starting to get some ribbon. And you see how it's starting to spread out now? Let me let it rivet some more. You, when it gets to this stage, you can do what they call the figure eight test. Can you draw a figure eight with the batter? Okay. As you can see, I got a figure eight there. And you see how everything's starting to move. We still have a few 
kind of defined edges here. But look right here. These kind of have melted back into themselves. It's so easy to overmix your batter. And it's trying to understand where that fine line is. So while I still have a few lines of definition, my figure eight for the most part has kind of melted back into itself. Let me make one more figure eight. the original figure eight, especially down here at the bottom, has kind of melted back into itself. This is the stage of macronage that I would stop. I'm just gonna fold kind of everything back into the center because our next step is to put this in the piping bag and start piping our shells. I like to cover my work surface with a towel. Um, because after we pipe our trays, we do need to bang the trays to release any trapped air bubbles that are in the batter. Um, we don't want our shells to explode in the oven because of the air bubble and kind of like a volcano. So that, that helps get rid of those air bubbles to uh, keep them from exploding in the oven and helps, us give, helps give us those smooth, nice shells. Grab our tray. Again, I'm using the one and a half inch template. Pour the batter into the piping bag. Let's get our batter. Now you want to squeeze your piping bag Hold your bag directly over top of the tray. I squeeze like one, two, three, and then I stop, and then I'll do just kind of a quick flick of the wrist. Like one, two, three, stop. One, two, three, stop. One, two, three, stop. One, two, three, stop. Now, if you can't do the flick of the wrist yet, just squeeze like one, two, three, stop. One, two, three, stop. One, two, three, stop. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Good. See, you'll get the hang of it. I'm squeezing with my, I'm right-handed, so I'm squeezing with my right hand, one, two, three, stop. I'm guiding the bag with my left hand. I'm trying to put equal pressure between the palm of my hand and my fingers. You want to hold the bag directly over the baking tray if you pipe from an angle, that's going to cause lopsided shells. So you want the batter to be as even as possible. That's why you want to keep the piping bag directly like over top of the tray. And then as you squeeze, the batter goes out. Okay, now we have batter left over. That will be used for another tray. So if you are using a template, make sure, just kind of lift up the corner here, slide that template out. You don't want to bake the tray with the template still underneath your um, silk hat mat. So now it's time to bang the tray. And what we're going to do here, this is why I have the towel so it doesn't damage my um, countertops. I'm just going to bang, and I'm putting some force on that, but don't be afraid. <laughs> I am, look, with my thumbs, kind of holding the sill pat down, and 
and I had some air bubbles pop. You can see those. But you can also see there's a couple of places where there's some bubbles that are trapped underneath the surface. So what we want to do now is use a scribe or a toothpick and pop those bubbles. So I have one right there. I'm gonna pop, and it's good to have like a paper towel close by so you can you know, wipe the tip of your toothpick or scribe. And then what you can do is like after you pop a big air bubble or something, use the scribe to just kind of smooth back out the, uh, the top of the shell. And just kind of go through. So if we do this really quickly after we pipe, um, because the batter has thinned out some, it'll almost fall back into itself. Sometimes it might need a little coaxing. There's a little one that needs a little coaxing. There could be a few more air bubbles. I just can't see them because of the light. But if there are, this will be a great example of what can happen when you have air bubbles. So we'll, this could be a nice experiment. I'm gonna set this tray to the side and we're gonna let it rest. So we want the shells to dry, not completely dry out, but we want them to form a skin. You want to be able to rub your finger across the top and batter not come off. Um, the time it takes for this to happen is entirely dependent on your environment. Um, it's going to be different for everyone. I personally live in a very dry environment. We have hardly any humidity where I live, so my shells dry really fast. Um, it can take, for the, on average, it's 15 to 20 minutes for me. Um, I would say the average person um, is 30 minutes. So you just you want to check about every, I don't know, five to 10 minutes and see how they feel. And when we when I'll keep a check on mine um, and show you what a dry shell, when the skin has formed, I'll show you what that looks like and how you can rub your finger over and no batter get back on your finger. So I'm going to set these to the side and let these rest and I'm going to pipe, since I have more batter left over, I'm gonna pipe another tray and we'll go from there. We need to preheat our oven for these shells that are resting. I'm gonna bake these shells at 300 degrees for 15 minutes. So I'm gonna preheat the oven to 300. Um, one of the things I absolutely love doing is teaching macaron classes and help help you learn the techniques and what to look for and watch for and you know I think it's truly beneficial to do virtual classes because you can bake in your own kitchen learn your environment learn your ovens because your oven is a, a critical piece in all of this as well and you know learning the attitude of your oven is what I like to call it so if that is something that you would be interested in and just like baking alongside me where I can see your batter and help you troubleshoot and things like that, I put a link in the description below. Um, if that interests you, uh, I'm teaching private classes right now. Uh, I'm looking to do some group classes in the very near future. Um, so keep an eye out on that. Um, I have a newsletter if you would like to join that and be notified when those classes are available. Um, you can also get that template for free. Um, just go to the link in the description below. But I want to help you as best as I possibly can on your macaron journey because, um, you know, it's definitely a journey. <laughs> and baking along somebody that has been baking these, uh, I'm now going on my ninth year. Um, I've had a lot of failure. I still have failure. Um, I like to do a lot of experiments. And, you know, I like to do some of the things that people would love to try, but they don't want to waste their ingredients and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I really enjoy that kind of stuff. So if a class is something you're interested in, click the link in the description below and check it out. I'd love to bake beside you. 
And speaking of experiments, this tray here is actually going to be an experiment for my next video. So you'll have to catch the next video to see the results. But what I'm going to be doing with this tray, um, we're resting this one. This is the traditional way of making macarons. Rest your shells until the skin forms. I read an interesting article um, just the other day um, talking about using the oven to dry your shells. If, you're, if you are in a humid environment, this might be a video you wanna watch and see how this comes out. So what I'm going to do is I've already preheated my lower oven to 350 degrees. So I'm not resting this tray. I'm going to put it directly into the oven. Now it's preheated to 350. When I put these in the oven, I'm gonna turn the temperature back down to 300 and bake for my normal time, three, uh, 15 minutes. Make sure to watch the next video that's published to see the results of this test. Okay, our shells have now been drying for um, 19 minutes. By the time we get in the oven, it'll be 20. Can you see the dull, the dullness, the matte finish? Okay, I'm going to touch a shell. Nothing comes off my finger. You can feel the skin on there. This is exactly what we want. I'm gonna put this in the oven. The oven is preheated to 300 degrees. My oven thermometer says it's 300 degrees in there, so we're going to bake these for 15 minutes. And we'll see how they come out. The oven is calling. Let's see how our shells turned out. I'm gonna do a wiggle test. The feet feel firm. So I'll go ahead and take them out. Here's how they look. See if you can see the nice feet on them. Okay, we're gonna let we're gonna let these cool. Actually, I'm gonna go to the other camera over here. I'm gonna cut one open just so you can see what it looks like straight out of the oven, and then um, we'll let these cool, and then I'll cut another one open, and we can see kind of maybe what happened on the inside after they cool. So stay tuned for that. These are the shells. They just came out of the oven. They form nice feet. The top feel nice and firm. I'm gonna cut one open and then let's just see what it looks like. Um, again, these just come out of the oven, so they're gonna be hot. And the bottom may stick to the mat. Oh, yeah, see, they need to cool, but, so our, <laughs> the meat of our shell stayed there, but what I want to show you is had our meat stayed with the shell, we very well, looks like we have full shells back here on the back. Okay, can you see that right out of the oven, it looks like we have a full shell? See that there? We're gonna let these cool and then we'll come back and see what they look like and see if the inside collapsed at all or if this was the right temperature and right time. Okay, now that the shells have cooled, I'm gonna cut open another one. This is the one that we cut open right after they came out of the oven. And see, it's nice and full. There was probably a little air pocket, some air that got right in there, which that's okay. Don't worry about that. Here's the other one that we just cut open after it's cooled. There was a little settling, but if you look on this half of the shell, it's full. 
there's a gap right there. Um, but if you look, let me see if I can get the camera to focus in there. It might be too close. It's hard to see, but I can see it. Um, it actually fills back up back there in the back. And this being full and that being full back there in the back, that makes me think right here, I had a good size air pocket that just didn't, um, we couldn't see it from the surface when we were popping those air bubbles. So that, you know, that's normal. I don't want you to freak out over that. But I would say overall, this is exactly what we're looking for. You know, you can work on um, getting those air bubbles and that's where, you know, Sometimes I get a little OCD. I tried not to be over the board OCD this time just for the video because honestly, they taste amazing. The structure, um, the texture is what it needs to be. So, you know, don't fret if your shells did not come out like this. This time, just write down everything you do and that will help you troubleshoot. And then you can go back and try again. I can't tell you the number of failed batches I've had before I finally had successful shells. It's just a matter of perseverance, not giving up, and, you know, keep trying. Try different methods. Today we did the Swiss method. Next time, I would suggest sticking with one method and one recipe. I would suggest um, sticking with one recipe master the recipe and then move on um, if you keep changing recipes and ratios and and things like that you're never really going to master the techniques and the technique is where 90 percent of your success happens so focus on your techniques first there's tons of recipes out there that are great that work well the ratios might be slightly different but Focus on the technique first, then play with the recipes. Now take your shells and pair them. You wanna get shells that are like the same size. Mm, let's see. Yeah, that one's a little better. That one's a little big. There we go. And then you wanna fill your shells with your favorite filling. Buttercreams are a really popular feeling. I love buttercreams. Ganache, different flavor ganaches are also very popular. Um, since we have yellow, lemon curd is a really popular feeling. And that's gonna be a mismatch. I'll just eat those two. Thanks for watching today's video. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And if you are interested in a baking class, check the link in the description below. And while you're here, make sure to watch these other Macron videos. Have a wonderful and blessed day.